Our next speaker is Jan Verschuld. I don't know if you how to pronounce it in the English way. It's okay. He's coming from the USA, University of Chicago, Illinois. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for uh, having me here again. Uh, so uh, this is a talk on a mathematical application uh, of ADA, of in particular uh, multitasking. Um, so I'm the only one in this session with a subtitle, and I'm glad that this isn't that this that didn't scare you off. So I'm glad you came. Um, <laughs> So um, here's my outline. So the main point of my talk is that um, ADA works extremely well uh, to define uh, sh shared memory parallel programs. Um, and the whole point is that you really get to do what you want to do. Um, so there is some mathematics on there. I will try to use the mathematics mainly to indicate how you can tune uh, your application. So computers are getting faster and faster, uh, but that's actually creating a problem for us. Uh, not, not that we have no things that don't go fast enough, but uh, making computers work efficiently is actually quite the challenge these days. Um, so here is the motivation. Um, so this is the picture. The picture is kind of misleading. Uh, what we actually are always looking at are uh, polynomial equations. Uh, so we have two polynomials in three unknowns. Uh, they define a space curve. So the space curve is this figure eight. So it's kind of bended. And uh, you are positioned at the top, uh, the point zero, zero, 002. So the point zero, zero, 002 satisfies these two equations. Uh, you know one point on a curve and you want to continue, you want to see what lies ahead. So you're going to compute power series expansions. The red one is the trivial one, so you think if you only do one term in your exponentiation, you think it's kind of a parabola. But uh, the, if you take more and more terms in that power series expansion, already actually the next one is here already very interesting. Uh, you see the crossing point. Uh, so this is where interesting things start to happen. And that crossing points, as you take more and more terms in your uh, power series, actually starts to approximate the real crossing point. Now, this is a misleading picture. We only see the equations. And actually, the crossing points is where uh, typically your power series will no longer converge uh, somehow. But here, actually, they allow you to say something about the behavior of that curve. Now, the point of the talk is to compute uh, this uh, efficiently. And uh, we run Newton's method all the time. So the Newton's method is probably the Newton's method that you have seen in high school. Uh, also with uh, power series curves, symbolically, as you have to do this by hand, you can actually compute term by term. What you need to do is you need to evaluate polynomials over and over again. Uh, and you also need to know all the partial derivatives. Um, so these are the... And there is then solving a linear system. So these are the three things that you have to do. You have to evaluate, differentiate, and solving a linear system. And it converges quadratically. So actually, Newton's method is a very promising method. Uh, but there are a lot of computational difficulties. Um, so uh, if you do this by hand, uh, you're quickly going to uh, give up uh, once you get past uh, even already for one variable. It might be hard. But uh, our curves, uh, they live in any dimension. Uh, so the degree of the curves, so I should have pointed this out previously. So this is a quartic, a curve of degree 4. So you have two equations of degree 2. If you have three equations in four variables, if there are quadratics, the degree is going to be 8. If you have four variables, five equations, the degree is going to be 16. 
So you can see that if it starts to get very quickly, every time you increase one of, of the dimension, your complexity of your problem actually doubles. So with 10 variables, uh, 11, uh, 11 variables, 10 equations, you may have a curve of degree 1,000. Now, even if you would fix, say, I'm not going to go past 10, then actually you have your power series, uh, and actually they go on forever, so there's no limit there. Uh, we have some power series that converge rapidly. Um, we are lucky. But some power series converge very, very slowly. So we may not know how far we need to go. And that was actually the motivation for this study as well. We want to have something that's running fast and allows us to compute a large, large degrees. And uh, so even if you would say I only compute eight terms, well, then there is the multi-precision arithmetic that you may need. Uh, so high degrees, things start to curve. Uh, the round off starts to creep in. Uh, double precision is unlikely to be sufficient. Um, so these are the three motivations that we have for using parallel computations. And uh, the code was developed on three different platforms. Uh, so the laptop that I have here with me is the middle uh, one. It's kind of the middle um, between these uh, other two configurations. Um, so f first of all, the, the obvious point is that you can't have single core processors anymore. Uh, all your processors are multi-core. Um, and uh, the, the other point I would like to make is that while it looks very interesting and appealing to have a, a, a workstation like that sitting on your desk, uh, but uh, having it fully, uh, so this is also uh, the workstation that is uh, serving our web server. So perhaps I should have said that right in the beginning. We also actually launch uh, a web server. Uh, so this machine is actually uh, hosting uh, the, the, the web interface to our software. So it has uh, 44 cores, and I get the best uh, results with 88 threads. Um, so, but I will restrict to the middle configuration. Um, and here is the ADA code. Um, uh, the ADA code that I have been using already now for a uh, very long time, and that I also actually have other people have used. Uh, so I saw a recent paper uh, that was published in Composite Structures of, of uh, Lamination Design. Uh, so if you want to know where polynomial systems occur in practical applications, if you have to design a <laughs> robot arm, for example, uh, a robot arm can take a possible configurations. So you can already see this uh, uh, with the elbow that I have. You, you want to reach a certain position, and then you want to compute all possible angles of your arm so that you can reach these positions. Now, uh, you don't want to twist uh, your elbow, so all the polynomial equations, they express that uh, the lengths of your uh, mechanism, they have to stay fixed. So, so, so the methods that I'm using often very well known into me mechanical design. Um, and my users, they simply download typically the uh, binary version, and if you have minus t, uh, it uses the multi-threading, and it actually runs this uh, very simple procedure. Uh, it launches uh, threads, and every task has a unique ID identification number, and that's that generic procedure. So th this is a generic procedure, the body of generic procedure, and the argument, uh, the generic parameter is the procedure job. So job is what I always provide, and I can tell each task specifically what to do based on its identification number. So tasks actually work on job queues. And okay, so if you want to write multitasking code, there are two main issues that you have to consider. Uh, the first one is memory. Uh, so every task has its own stack, but they all share the same heap. Uh, so if you start allocating and deallocating, you better do that outside uh, the uh, task uh, routines. So everything that you do on these power series, you have to allocate the auxiliary vectors outside. 
and pass those pointers to the auxiliary data structures in the arguments of the jobs. Um, so the second thing that you have to worry about is the granularity of your computations. That, so there should be actually enough parallelism. Uh, so typically you have a limited number of tasks, but the tasks actually need sufficiently many jobs to do. Um, uh, sometimes you need to synchronize. Uh, the easiest way to synchronize is just so synchronization means that uh, there is a piece uh, and all the tasks have to wait uh, to a certain point to continue. The easiest way is actually to stop the tasks and then to relaunch them. Uh, so that's the way we do the synchronization right now. So these are the two main issues. Um, I actually have three implementations already of my power series library. So uh, don't give up. Uh, so you have, first of all, the functional correctness, but then you have to think of it in a whole different way when you think of uh, the shared memory parallel computation. And then, of course, there are always other issues. I will point out some other issues. Um, Okay, so now uh, what do we do? We evaluate and differentiate. Um, this is something that I also did, did only learn uh, when I was uh, doing the parallelism. So you may have seen rules to differentiate uh, all compute all partial derivatives. Uh, the cool thing is that if you have uh, a product of n variables, if you do this symbolically, it will be an n square operation. But you can actually do this in a linear time, linear in the number of variables. Uh, you can see if you take this simple product of variables here, uh, if you, you, you have the stars, so you can compute. So the, the, the left here are actually the names of the variables, so the kind of funny names. But uh, at the right, you see all the star operations. Uh, the point is also the star is not the star of numbers. Uh, so we multiply power series with each other. And the coefficients, again, are typically uh, multi-precision numbers, double, double, quad doubles. So there's a lot of arithmetic overhead here. So you may want to save on uh, the number of multiplications. Uh, the bottom line here is that uh, this is kind of the saving step in what makes everything very run very well in our uh, parallel computations. There is a straightforward parallelism. So a polynomial, so the name says, says it itself, there are many, 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 many monomials. And you can compute all the monomials independently. So you have a very straightforward parallelism here. Um, so that's the, the, the first mathematical idea. Uh, the second one is that uh, you can work with a matrix of power series and invert that. That's all very fun. But actually what you should do is you should look at a power series where the coefficients are matrices. And uh, I worked here the simplest example. We are going to solve a linear system. So the matrices are our partial differentials uh, that we have computed. So they are power series again. Now, if we linearize it, we arrive at, uh, we arrive at the block triangular system. So even if you, uh, for example, you can invert uh, power series. Polynomials, are, they have no inverse. Power series, they do. That's kind of the cool thing. And this slide also actually uh, shows this. So you have to compare, if you solve the inverse, so you actually you're after the updates in your Newton's methods. So you have to invert the matrix A naught. And once you invert the matrix A naught, you adjust the right-hand sides. And here's where the pipelining comes in. So you do the first update, the delta X naught, and then you update uh, the right-hand sides, the B1 and the B2. And they can happen independently. Um, and this is where your parallelism comes in. So here you can have two tasks working independently in the second step. So here you have a maximal speed up of two, uh, no matter how large your matrices are, if you do this with this uh, uh, f very coarse uh, granularity. Now, of course, if the matrices start to get larger, you better use a multitask QR. So we have also played with that. Um, so this is kind of the bottleneck at this point. So at this point, this is still a work in progress. Uh, so these are timings that I did yesterday in my hotel room on this laptop. 
uh, trying to see what happened, how far I can go with the degrees of the truncated power series. Um, so this was done in double arithmetic. Um, it was done on, on a ten-dimensional benchmark system. Um, if you're really curious, you can figure out or via my websites what the polynomials really look like. Um, so with uh, degree 16, uh, I doubled uh, the number of tasks in each step. Um, so at best I can go get close to four. Um, so the polynomial system is actually very, very mild as far as nonlinearities go. You can read it, uh, these columns, uh, from top to bottom, but I also like to read them diagonally. If you go from degree 32 to 64, you kind of double uh, the size. Now, this is not a linear operation, these multiplications of power series, so you almost get a tenfold uh, overhead if you want to do that. Now, if you then use your 16 uh, tasks, this is where you have kind of the speed spot where with 16 tasks you still get a little bit more of speed up. Now, the, the, the time actually then doubles. So from the 2.3, you go to the 5.2 seconds. Um, uh, yeah, and at that point, uh, so this is ongoing work. Uh, for this laptop, the fan starts to get blowing at uh, 64 uh, degrees. And I don't want to exhaust that uh, pure laptop. But on a, on a bigger server, uh, it's actually much more challenging because then also the precision, the quad double precision starts to deteriorate a little already. So we're still working on getting the precision uh, fixed. But as far as the uh, parallelism goes, it's fairly simple to implement. And you can focus on the mathematical difficulties. Um, and also, whenever you have uh, an application, you can focus on really what matters. And we have five minutes left for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, you have said that uh, you have test on a two uh, times 22 core. And uh, for at least one of the things you tried, you had the max speed up with 88 tasks, so which is uh, twice the number of cores. Is that really uh, an either credit core? Yes, uh, so uh, the question. Otherwise, how do you explain that? Yes, so, so, uh, so the question is how do we actually get uh, the best uh, speed up at 88? Uh, so the. Uh, Processors indeed support hyper-threading. Um, but then I don't get a 88. I think I get the best I get is close to 60 somehow. And this is really for the polynomial evaluation, where every monomial can be evaluated independently. Yeah. Second question is, in what you are doing, how much uh, uh, is the use of the vector instructions? Uh, that's a very good question. How much is used of the vector instructions? Um, that I don't know. Um, uh, well, I, I know when I do my linear algebra uh, column-wise, like the Fortran does, uh, then I get uh, better uh, performance. But the performance actually then uh, deteriorates when I use complex numbers. So if I do floating-wise column-column, then uh, the compiler and still can actually do the vectorization correctly. Uh, but I still have to figure out how actually the compiler will figure it out for complex numbers. And then there are also complex double-doubles, complex quad-doubles. Uh, so that's then another challenge, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, if we have a few minutes before you leave, I remind you that uh, all this dead room has been organized by Dirk Reiner, who unfortunately is not here. For those who were not here at the beginning, he broke his leg, so he uh, took over his duty. 
but he did a terrific job in organizing things and getting the speakers together and getting the room again. And I got the message that he's watching us on a live uh, stream. So please, a big applause for Jeff. <laughs>